help that uh, guy that came last time? Yeah, yeah, I talked to him so it work. Yeah, he's a good guy. He just, uh, uh, um, well, it's complicated. <laughs> You have started from here, I don't see nobody else down there. Yeah, I'll get started. Didn't want well, me to get started, you're going back. <laughs>
But anytime I think that you can talk about Christ and God is, is good, if you are of a common mind. It's difficult to speak, understand, and accept a conversation when you're not of the same mind. You have conflict there. Difficulties in communication. So I hope that we can meet today, this morning, in a common mind, that common mind on Jesus Christ. I thought many times as far as standing here before a congregation, however, of whatever size, in fear, thinking, well, what shall I say or how can I say it? And just leave it to God and let him guide you. That's why we have time in this position and the first to, to be before Christ, to stand before a congregation. Boy, I thought, what do I say? That's the question. What do I say? And you don't know. Leave it up to God and let him guide your mind. But I can't help but believe you have to be able to be guided before you ever enter the door. Something has to direct your mind before you ever enter the door because when you get on this side of that door, your mind is in one line and that is with Christ. So they let us think on Christ and leave nature outside of it. To me, every day that I get up and I look in the mirror, I can see the devil because the devil and nature is the same and that is in me. So if I can get rid of that nature, get rid of that devil, then I can be happy. We talked last evening, Brother Jimmy Dell and I, and I'm still confused on that. We're still trying to, to determine and depict. And that's one thing that I think that the first speaker uh, that gets up before a congregation, void of mind, and if he has a question, he can ask that question and raise that question. And then in the process, whoever follows, can answer that question. Maybe not that day. Maybe not that day, but another time down the road. Give them time to think about it and consider. Maybe then later they can answer that question that you might have. And that is a, depicting for me a, a problem on in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it goes on. We talk about eternity. What is eternity? Eternity is the habitation of God. And I've always said, if we get to eternity, we have to be with God. So that there's just no getting around that. Yet, nature and man put eternity in a separate place. So you understand that. To me and to my understanding, eternity is here. On earth with us and in us. I look at it in my view as I have my own eternity. My eternity began the day I was born. My eternity will end the day I die. But God's eternity or man's eternity continues to go ever and ever and ever and ever as long as there's a man, a believer on the face of the earth, eternity is there and God is there. And that's where we want God. That's where I want to see God in eternity, and the only place I can see God in that eternity is here. And that's what I'm looking for. Well, let us sing a song. We'll go before this God in prayer, and perhaps he will enlighten one of our elders to open my mind through their talk. Maybe God will loose their tongue and we can learn today. Sing a song. You've got one. Try 219. 219. <laughs>
It lies in the Lord our own weaknesses. We ask thee now, Heavenly Father, to tarry with us. Through this life, Heavenly Father, that we have been given, open up our minds and our hearts that we may receive you. Heavenly Father, we ask thy blessings upon this little congregation today. Bless the sick, the afflicted, Heavenly Father. May it be with thy will, O Lord, that our mother and brother elder, brother elder, Heavenly Father, be healed and be able to rejoin us, Heavenly Father, hope. Dear Lord, ask that you bless us, all those the sick and afflicted throughout this land. We have many problems, Lord, in our land and in your land. Open up the minds and hearts of thy people, O Lord, that they can understand. God, if it would be thy will, bless the sick and afflicted throughout this world, Heavenly Father, we pray. In thy name, the Son, and thy Son, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, we will say amen. <laughs> This is something I, when I read, read it, I think of Brother Reese. Blessed are when, blessed are ye, when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company. And I think when I read that, I think of Brother Reese big time. You know the way they did you, and they know so little, and they're so lost in my mind. And right now, where I'm at. My mind is all I know, and I think that God gave me that, and it's where I'm at, and like Brother Reed says, it's what I know. I don't know, you know, no other way. Down the road somewhere, I'm open to change. It's like I tell everybody. You show me in here, in this book, where it says that there's a lot after this this one, that we're, I mean, I know that our soul goes back to God who gave it. What that consists of, I have no knowledge, and I don't think no one else does. And if they show me where that I'm going to go back there and I'm going to have a body that's coming out of the grave at the end of time, and if they show me that there's an end of time in here, I will believe it. They can't show me none of that that I've ever read. And I've read it a couple of times. And when they shall separate you, from their company and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil. That's what they did to Brother Reese and my uncle. For the Son of Man's sake. And that's what it was for. They were preaching something that they felt wasn't true. And they opposed God. You know, that's what we're supposed to do. Rejoice you in that day 
and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. And I hope and I pray that that's the reward that you get here in heaven in life. Many times. For in like manner did their fathers un <laughs> unto the prophets or the prophets before. <laughs> Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers of the false prophets. <laughs> I mean that to me that says a lot in itself. For it's where you've been and where you've come. And I just had to read that this, this morning. But I'm also, if I can find it, the Beatitudes is, in Matthew is completely different than they are in Luke. And I like the ones that's in Luke. And if I can find them. in here if you didn't want 
wants to do it. You know, he wants us to love everybody. And if we love our enemies, he definitely would love them. All he is is love. So that's all he's asking us to be more like him. And that's where I'm at, I guess. And I hope for one of these days, if I live long enough, to be able to do that. Where it gets on down and says, if he hits so the man slaps you on one cheek, turn your other. Christ did that. If you stop and think about it, when they took him into the, whatever it was, the king or the boss, what have you, they spit on him, they put the crown on him. He never opened his mouth. That's what I think that he, I don't know that he expected it, if he expected it, he would give it to us. But I think that's where he wants us to be. That's where he wants us to do. He wants us to love. Love is where it's all at in my mind. It's true, boy. That is the only thing that we need to come through this book, read it all, and when you get to the end, love is what matters. If you love, and you've got it. You know, you're, you're complete. And that is... As what was it the uh, disciple said? It's hard to uh, derive that or everybody put, put it in a different word, but it's hard to <laughs> excel. And then, I mean, you know, this stuff is hard to excel. That's way beyond my means right now. But like I say, one of these days I will hope to be there. I think that's where we all strive to be in time. Will we ever make it? Only God knows. And if he, if he wants us there, He'll put us where he wants us. That free will stuff is, you know, that's all. It's like I told Brother Pat, if it's up to free will, I'm out there in the world, <laughs> doing whirlwinds and everything, you know. I'm doing whatever I want. But with God in control, I don't want to do that stuff. I, I've lost it all. But at one time, holy, oh, I'm big in it. <laughs> big, big in it. No bigger. And I've done my part to run and still do. I'm... Um, Far, far from perfect. But I'm, I'm striving to get there, and that's where we all are in my mind. Thank God for his blessings. Well, what you just said, Brother Jimmy, tell us what's wrong with the church today. They, they quit striving, and they think that uh, they're just waiting to go to heaven. Uh, they don't even know what's love. They don't love their own self. Right, right. right. They can't. And they stop learning. They don't think there's anything else to learn. As soon as you get saved, you know it all. <laughs> they just give up. That's when you start. That's when you girl. It's just you know, a man. You've got, no, you got no teachers anymore. No elders to, to do that. You'll splash out in the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> Wave back. Look at Drink so, the clouders and look at the ocean. The truth wait. is, it's just like this. Right. 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 All your life, you're striving to gain. Pull your fingernails out and toenails and everything. Yeah, that's the whole thing that Paul done was teach to strive. And, you know, they, King James called it perfection, but uh, it's maturity. Yeah. I mean, very mature, few mature Christians in our country today. They don't know their left hand from their right. That's what Christ says, you know, have mercy on them because they don't know them. That's another thing I, I had read about uh, the little light, so to speak, the, putting the, camp, the light under the uh, bushel. Yeah. That is, if you read that, the light is the body. The, the body. That's Christ. I mean, the whole thing, and, and people take that because he's asking you to let your light shine. He's asking you to let Christ shine and be the head in the kingdom oh, with him. You're, he is above all things and keep him there. Right. That's where you want him at, a head. He is the head and we are the body and he is the light. Through him we see all. <coughs> that's the only way we can see it is with him. I could, I said, I could, I could sit and yak all night, you know, <laughs> and get nowhere, but I love it. And I love to hear you guys Yes, because you guys teach me a bunch. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I love good. to listen. That's where it's supposed to be, back and forth. Just like playing ping pong, it's back and forth. You may see something. Exactly. We all need each other. But, uh, you know, most people, we can't. Well, I don't believe that. Well, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Search it out. Right. We both may be wrong. Right. Find something else. Right. And, exactly. Plan it up. Let it
Hey, you brother, can, you can show me I'm wrong. I'm open. <laughs> you know, I'm not cold-minded, I hope. Well, that's the way I feel. Um, some, I don't know, they, they, they get all puffed up and they know a little bit. Yeah. And, and they're just, I think that's really sometimes what it's talking about the rich and the poor. The rich, they have no mean anything. Right. And the rich are, and especially in the context of Jesus' time, the rich are the only ones that could afford education. So they felt like they didn't even know anything else. Or I think sometimes that's what he's getting at. It's those that don't feel like they need to know anymore, they're not going to learn anything. <laughs> those are poor and uh, want to learn. <laughs> you know, uh, they all sit at the feet of Jesus and, you know, they, they, they want to. Like the trunks. Yeah, yeah, they want to hear the, the good news. And, uh, uh, I don't know. You, it's the way people go at it, trying to understand the Bible. It, it's it, it is difficult because uh, some of the ideas they have about Scripture. And that's one thing I really like about our tradition. Is uh, we're good with wrestling with it and, and understanding you got to do that. Uh, one of my buddies we met last night over church in Rogersville, and we. Uh, Sung a little bit, played some music, and we do that sometimes. It's really good. And I got tickled because he wrote a song about our church. <laughs> it's, it's in the tune of the House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> and it's the best thing, the best gift that he could ever give me. But it's uh, in it, you know, it's about how the other people would see us as, uh, well, you guys don't believe in anything. Why would you even get together? And at the end of it, it's like, if you don't want to learn anything, Stay out of this church. <laughs> so it really, uh, man, that, that meant a lot to me. That, uh, he's supposed to be meeting with us next week and start coming on a regular basis. So I'm tickled about that. Uh, really appreciate being here. And this has been good so far. I've been looking back. Just speaking of this, um, you know, it, it, how we approach the Bible, too. I mean, it doesn't make it sort of confusing because again it's all of how you interpret things so you know like I said for years when I was with the missionary Baptist and was preaching about you got to get saved and you just worry about that sort of thing and everything you read in the Bible had to do with that because uh, it's like when you buy a new hammer everything looks like a nail and you just think that one thing solves all your problems and you just see it all in that way some people I'll probably think that's the way we approach, you know, the idea of hell is we're, we're talking about that all the time. Like some old Baptists talk about predestination every time they turn around. Uh, I remember going around a lot of different primitive Baptist churches when I was with the kind of the mainline primitive Baptists. And uh, everywhere you go, it seemed like you'd run into that. It's like, uh, I was like, are, are all these preachers talking to each other when they get up? And they all kind of say the same thing. Reminded me of the missionary Baptists I came from that all they ever talked about is how to get saved. And uh, so they, they just don't delve into it very much. But when we approach the Bible as if you can't question anything about it and you have to take it on face value, you lose all kinds of good stuff that's there that really makes it rich. Uh, when I look back at Jeremiah, and this is some tedious reading, I know. It, it's, it's a sick book. Any of the prophets... Until you get down to minor prophets, uh, you know, the major prophets, it's, it's some thick reading. And if you kind of don't know how to approach it, it's just hard to make heads or tails of it. But a, a lot of what they're responding to is when the first temple fell and when Jerusalem fell at the hands of the Babylonians. And why am I saying all this? Well, I'm saying this to, to let us know there are some things here that very much have everything to do with the day we live. Because we all know that history is written by victors. Uh, history is not written by the losers. <laughs> we, we all know that. Jeremiah is no different. Uh, we may not know the fact that uh, we have, this is, a, this is a, especially what we have right here, what you have in your Bible, King James, whatever it is. You have the Babylonian version, the Babylonian Jews. So we don't hear something about that because we don't know it, but uh, when the Jews were taken away in captivity, some of them went to Babylon, some of them fled to Egypt, and that's where you hear about like the Coptic churches, or you hear about um, African Jews, or things like that, is, uh, and then they've got different versions of something. Well, there's a different version of Jeremiah that's a Greek 
version that came out of the Egyptians, that you know, that the people that fled from Jerusalem and went to Egypt. The copy we have, <laughs> and it's not a huge difference, but there are some differences in how they approach this. Uh, but we're, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this, but, uh, and you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to answer, but how, how many people do you think was carried away in, in, to captivity? I mean, do you think it was just thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people? Because uh, uh, I always thought that. I always thought, man, well, you hear about a nation coming in, destroying Jerusalem, and taking all these people captive. Well, Jeremiah actually tells us in chapter 52 how many people were taken. And when you get into it, uh, I mean, you can read it. I don't want to bore you death with it, but there's about 4,600, about 4,600. Why are they making such a big deal out of that few of people? Well, uh, about how many people died on 9 11? 3,000. 3,000. And that just changed the world then. Because now everybody talks about it's a post 9 11 world. Uh, so th this is kind of what was going on with Israel and the Jews and the region that they lived in. Those 4,000 that were carried out, these were all the royal family, the priests, uh, the scribes, people, the opinion makers. Like we've got uh, the arms of the political parties have their news organizations. And I don't have to tell you which one's which. You know, I don't want to get into the whole political thing this morning. But we know who's going to toe the line for whoever's in the whites. That's what they had in Jerusalem is, uh, and that's when you're uh, uh, an empire like the Babylonians, you had to get rid of those people and take them back to where you are. And you don't really care about the peasants like us. <laughs> you know, that's why we can, we can all have our opinions and take a side and we can all get mad at each other about politics. They don't care. <laughs> They'll sit up there and eat their steak and, you know, and that. laugh at us. We're all getting mad at each other. Uh, like one, what they do in Washington, you know, they all go to each other's weddings, and they all, you know, it's like professional wrestling. It's, you know, I, I grew up watching wrestling, Pat would get up and mad, and he'd be, he'd be ready to fight. And he'd say, Well, that ref needs to look over here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and you, you'd think these people hated each other. The way they I'm going to come after you, Iron Sheik, and I'm going to, and that's the way politicians play this out. Well, uh, what we get from Jeremiah is, is kind of that way, because you can read in Jeremiah at the very beginning of it, is uh, Jeremiah came from a place that's called Anatoth. And then when you go back to King David when he's dying, he gives his son Solomon a kill list. He doesn't give him instruction about how to be this wise person. He says, no, you're going to have to consolidate power. You're going to have to kill some people. And here's who you need to kill so you, you can take the throne. You say, I never knew that. It's in there. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's uh, uh, pretty interesting, I think. It's more interesting than all the things you hear about David being this wonderful person and then he has an affair and, and all that's interesting too. But uh, <clears throat> the fact is Solomon has to consolidate power. He has to kill people. And there was this priest that was against Solomon and he really couldn't kill him because this priest had kind of backed David. And, uh, you know, you really can't kill a priest. It's not good, not good politics to do that. So Solomon banished this guy to Anathoth. And uh, Jeremiah comes out of that family. So when you come from a banished family and you're writing a book about how screwed up the rulers are in Jerusalem, you think it's going to paint a picture? You think it's going to maybe affect the way you write a book? Yeah, it's, it's going to affect everybody. Because <laughs> um, what Jeremiah is writing about, the reason why Israel and Jerusalem is going to fall, is not what you find in some of the other traditions among the Jews. Because some will look back at the law, and it's wrapped up in the book of Deuteronomy, which is if you follow the Lord and do right, you'll be blessed. If you forget, you're going to be cursed. And some use that and stick to that and say, well, uh, and you find traditions like that throughout the Old Testament. That's why sometimes you'll see where uh, some will come and say, well, you've, you've worshipped other gods. You've worshipped idols. You've done wrong. This is why God is mad. But then you get to the book of Job. And Job, what did he do? Did he worship other gods? Or 
Job didn't do anything wrong. But bad things happened to him. So there's a tradition that grew out of Jeremiah and that family out of Anatoth that said, you know what, maybe it's not that you've done something wrong is the reason why something bad has happened to you. Maybe, there's, maybe the world's a little more complicated than that. And when, by the time you get to the book of Job, <coughs> and you can tell it's edited and sliced together, because at one point, uh, you know, <coughs> Job's still standing, and all these spirits have come to him, and they've all told him the, the traditional wisdom, which is you've done something wrong. You've had to have done so maybe, maybe you just don't even know you did something wrong. And we've never heard. Nobody's ever told us that. You know, you, you know, and any of us at all that have experienced loss, and I guess that's why I'm saying about Jeremiah, is this is one of the greatest losses that Israel had experienced was to lose Jerusalem and lose the temple. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's like after 9-11, everybody was asking, why, why does the world hate us? You know, and uh, there were one or two great politicians that were able to stand up. So you know all the wars that we've caused in the world and all the pain that we've had and all the violence. We may have pissed some people off. <laughs> and but, but the vast majority, they're listening to traditional wisdom coming from the both major political parties saying, no, no, they just hate us because we're free. They hate us because of this and that. You know, so uh, what a prophet does, a prophet isn't somebody just foretells the future. And that's sometimes that's what we're told to do. But a prophet's one that understands the times. He knows a little bit about what's going on and at least gives some kind of interpretation of it. And what made me think about all this was thinking about, uh, you know, songs that are written and poems that are written. And, uh, you know, some really speak to us and, and some just seem silly. You know, a lot, a lot of country music now seems kind of silly because it all has the same need. And <laughs> it's made to appeal to a broad audience. And I could... I could give a flip about hearing like, about <laughs> songs about beer and trucks and women wearing clothes and pipe. They don't have a pretty cool experience. But now there's some songs that just really like it just gets down to the heart of it. When you know about loss and if you've lost a child or if you've lost a, a, you know, a love in your life, it just rips you apart. And the vast majority of what's in Jeremiah is poetry. It's not so evident, especially the King James Version of the Bible, kind of lays it all out as like a, a report, but it's not a report. There's a lot of poems in there, and you can tell they've been edited together for a certain way to tell a certain story. And the poems are powerful, <clears throat> and they, they tell us a lot about what was going on and, and, and how they viewed things. But what it was, you had a point in time where they were suffering loss and they're trying to figure things out and they just didn't know how to interpret anything. They just didn't know what sense to make it. If you've ever had that happen in your life, you know something about that. If you've ever had something hit you and jar you, you weren't expecting somebody to come to you and tell you, somebody that you knew or maybe your child or your, your parents, maybe one of them was in a car wreck and just all of a sudden something, or you're told that you've got cancer or, or, or some major thing and it jars you and you, your whole world is upside down. Yep. And this is what's going on. This is what you find in this poetry a lot. It just, it seems lengthy, but it's all just pouring over this, this fact that uh, there's been this huge loss. So it's, it's, a, it's a poem about deportation and exile. What we would call hell. <laughs> yeah. If you've ever been in places like that in the dark and exile, if you've ever felt deported, you feel like you don't know who you are anymore. If you've ever felt like that, then you know what they're going through at this time. Uh, you know, and then of course, again, you've got all sorts of different people trying to blame certain things for what was going on just like now. You've got conservatives will say, well, it's because we're killing all the kids and we don't have enough guns and you know, all this sort of stuff. The liberals are saying, well, it's, it's because everybody doesn't have economic justice or we've not saved the planet. Or you got all these different extremes on both sides telling us why America is under God's judgment. <laughs> but nobody wants to look at themselves and say, what can I do for myself? Uh, you know, 
for all the consternation and things that people go through a lot of times for whatever issue that they have, uh, I'm going to, you know, not bragging on us, but I'm saying, uh, I don't know too many of our friends that go on about some issues that ever adopted any kids. You know, some have. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, we, we've got all kinds of uh, explanations as to why America is going in the direction it's going. It's going in the direction it's going because what do we believe? We believe God is sovereign. God is leading it that way. God is going to take us wherever he wants us to go. <laughs> so thank God. But we, exactly. So we, we can spend all the time listening to all the prescriptions we have for how we can turn us around and do this and that. But we ultimately know that it comes down to us. You know, uh, what what little bit of power we have, uh, we have to maybe just change ourselves. So I can't I can't hardly change my wife, I can't really change my kids. We have, we still believe that, don't we? That God has the hearts of men and women and kids in his hand. Correct. The women switch away the way you will. Yeah. And there are some people you can reason with that have the ability to do so. And there's some people that are going to go the direction they're going. I don't care what kind of picture you paint for them. I remember what it was to be a kid and, uh, you know, people trying to warn me about lessons they learned in their 20s and 30s. I don't care what they think. So I'll do what I want to do. I'll do it better. <laughs> they don't know. They, they don't know what I know. You know, you know how you think when you're 17, 18 years old, or it's been a while I know for some, it's been a while for me too. But, uh, you're different. You know, it's hard for you to just had to ask me. That's right. That's right. right. Do that. I felt, I, again, I felt probably like a rich man. Yeah. I just, I don't need you or anybody else. <laughs> yeah. who, who are you to even talk to me? You know? But that's, that's kind of what we face. And then, um, you know, if we don't want to actually adhere to something that has places some responsibility in their hands. That's why it's a lot easier for our brothers and sisters out here to go to a lot of different churches and talk about getting saved and going to heaven because they're waiting for God to sort all these things out instead of actually being right here in our responsibility in our hands to say, you know, what we can do, we do it. <laughs> and what amends I can make in life, just, just like uh, I believe what, what Jimmy is saying, uh, you know, I think Jesus, of course, especially in the time that they were in, he's talking about loving your enemies. That was a hard thing to do when you have Roman soldiers <laughs> had all the guns, and I, you know, I, don't know, I know they didn't have guns, but I'm just trying to paint the picture. They had all the artillery. They had the power. And they let you know who had the power because they'd hang on a tree and let everybody know who had power. So uh, when you see things like that, it's a little hard to love your enemy. You know, but of course, we want to make an enemy out of everybody because we have to hate Russia and China and everybody else. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> we, we just have to have these things because if we didn't have wars and things, what would we want to do? We're just going to make the world better? I mean, what, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> but um, we're not good at listening. I, I, I just want to get into this fact, too, that, uh, you know, after this captivity, and, and we're not just left in in utter despair, but uh, when you get into the history of Israel, there's a king, a Persian king that comes along named Cyrus, who that uh, in Isaiah, he calls him the Messiah. He's the anointed one of God. Because what's he gonna do? He's gonna let them come back. He's gonna let them come back. He's gonna save them. But some of them, they don't want that. They don't want some boy. They don't want some Gentile. They don't want some Persian. Save them. Now that, that seems a little silly, but that's when we get to this scripture about the potter and the clay. And uh, we've, I don't mind John Calvin and the way he took some of this stuff, but we think, uh, you know, it all has to do with uh, eternal life and those sorts of things. But really what he's getting at here is those that did not want to follow that decree and say that, well, Cyrus is going to let them go back to the land. They're, they, they're, they're saying, no, we don't want to hear that. You know, we, if, if a Jew doesn't lead us back, we don't want them. Uh, you know, it would be, it, it would be kind of like when the, when the slaves were free and then you'd have slaves say, well, no, unless a black man leads us back, we're not going to go. And that may have happened in some cases. I don't know that that happened, but, uh, you know, like we weren't going to follow a white man or something like that. That's kind of the same issue here. Jews, some Jews were saying, no, we're not going to do that. 
And that's when uh, in Isaiah 45, uh, Isaiah's, uh, he, you know, he's talking about the part of the clay. He said, you really going to uh, say something to the one that's made the way? Now, he's the one that said this. Or uh, he, even, he even gets down to brass tacks here. And he says, you gonna, would, you, would you as uh, inside your father, uh, you know, being planted inside your mother, would you look up at your father? And he says that pretty plainly in Isaiah. Would you look up and say, why are you doing this? That's, that's, how, that's how ridiculous it seemed. Uh, you know, and, and I, again, we, we, we want to question why certain things are the way they are. Well, the thing we don't want to do is listen to all the conventional wisdom that tells us to give up, forget all that. That, that whole notion about God being sovereign and uh, held in something about, you know, you suffer here in the world, that's all nonsense and silly. Uh, you know, you, you need to follow me the streets of gold somewhere out there after you die. Uh, that's not silly because when you're inside of a certain belief, nothing seems silly. I mean, even the snake handlers think they're crazy. They think we're crazy because they don't handle snakes, you know, because it makes sense to them in their own uh, religious views. Just like Mormons can't understand why people aren't Mormon, you know. So, uh, but once you finally kind of look outside of that, and it's it's a little easier to see the cracks in those belief systems. Uh, you know, lot, lots of people aren't willing to do that. But, again, the reason I'm saying all of this is to, to sort of get us to thinking about when you go into these scriptures, it's, it's okay to question some of this. As you, you'll see, what I'm saying is the book of Job is nothing but a, just, a, just a slap, just a punch in the face to the whole notion that, you know, no, you've got to follow what you're told to do, and if you don't do that, then you, you have to do what the law says, and you're going to be cursed. And, and Job goes against that, Isaiah, Jeremiah, some of the others, there's these traditions that grow out of that that go away from that. But what I'm trying to say is the truth, it gets a little more complicated than just the simple stuff. That's why, again, it, it's, it, it sounds so much better, and it's much easier just to say, well, when I die, I'm going to get up out of the grave. You know, the graves are going to bust open. That, that's, that's a whole lot easier pill to swallow than uh, for us to say, how about I just don't know about some of that stuff? <laughs> that's, that's a hard one because, um, again, you, you see uh, the world and it just doesn't make a lot of sense to you. And you hear a story that helps you kind of kind of soothes your conscience and makes you feel better. And some people say, well, isn't it better just for people just to feel better and to deal with it that way? Well, it is sometimes. But uh, in my years of doing counseling before, uh, you never really move forward until you lay all your cards out on the table and you're able to say, this is my fault. <laughs> i got to do something about it. i got to do something better. And where am I getting all this? I'm getting all this right out of the Old Testament. The Old Testament that a lot of people hate. <laughs> that, that don't understand it. They think it's just old history. Uh, we got Jesus now. We're under law. We were under grace. We're not under law. That sort of thing. And, and just forget the fact that all these great, rich uh, lessons that we can learn to help guide us and teach us, uh, but it takes a little work. Yeah, and, but I think it does take what, what you're talking about. Uh, back, uh, back to Luke, it takes acknowledging the fact that uh, we're poor, weak, and worthless <laughs> without yeah. the mercy and grace of Christ to teach us. We're nothing. Exactly. exactly. It's, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of things to learn from, from um, again, these, these lessons that seem kind of daunting and they're hard to understand. They're hard to understand because a lot of times we've not had uh, people willing to dive into it and kind of help us understand it. It's just easier just to get to the other stuff. That's what I'm saying is a lot of churches, even in Old Baptist, it's just easier to uh, go to what you know, is easy for us. It's easy for us to talk about sovereignty and predestination and all those kinds of things. Uh, but what I like is so, some things that we can glean help us to kind of figure out where we are now. And we don't have to get sucked into the way the world thinks about things. The world isn't just going to offer you something. And by, by the world, I mean the things a lot of times that we like. I like some things that people say and it seems to make sense, but then there's times I think, well, is this really, is it, the, I have to really get back and think through it. 
just make sure it does make some sense. Because uh, uh, we're called upon not to do what's easy. Because it, it is easy to just kind of go with it. And just go with everybody else. It's, it's harder to just kind of stand on your own. Well, just like this, it's hard sometimes to meet. And there just be a few of us. When uh, if we just tweak things here and there and we're willing to accept things that we know don't make sense to us anymore, well, we can just be among a lot more people. But, uh, boy, that'd be miserable. Then you give it up. <laughs> God, that'd be miserable. Yeah, so uh, I guess what I'm getting at, too, is, you know, truth has consequences. And uh, learning some things has consequences, too. But uh, I really appreciate being able to get together like this. You know, there's sometimes we shout the house down, or sometimes it's just nice to have this, just a good conversation, and just talk a little bit. So if that's you, all I got. If you don't ask questions, how can you possibly learn? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I was told when I was little, never ask questions about things that, you know, you, I go, how can I learn right. if I don't ask God? Yeah. You know, he's, he's, he's there to help me and, and willingly teach me. I gotta ask. It says, "Not and you shall receive." You know. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the problem with a, a, a lot of congregations and organizations. They, it's easy, you know. They got their four or five little things that they believe, and that's all they want to talk about. It's all they ever preach about. Uh, but this stuff with God is so deep. Think about this. Oh. An infinite mind, an infinite God, sovereign God. Yeah. And I'm so thankful today that uh, up for all of you, it, it's all good. But bringing out the sovereignty of God, uh, you'll never hardly hear that anywhere unless you go to some old Baptist. But then, too, then they can misscrew that, too, the way they do some things. Because, uh, you know, this thing is uh, for here, it's not for eternity. He didn't uh, predestinate. Uh, Jacob to heaven and Esau to hell. You know, that, that's not what it's about. Uh, and there's so many deep things with, you know, you, you just look at that and it seems like that's just black and white. But you got to read between the, pe the lines, the white. And this thing is a revelation. It's not uh, the knowledge of man. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's, it's his revelation to us. He revelated it to the people of, of that time that through Paul uh, what was coming. And I'm a man, and I'm, you may disagree with me, but even with all those scriptures, I think it's threefold. And back to the law, and you know, they were stalking them people. We're not worried about Levites and stuff like that, but there's there's knowledge in there for us today. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the uh, Jesus's day; that was still law day. That wasn't grace; that was law. Mm -hmm. And he was telling them that there's a new day coming, there's a kingdom coming, mm -hmm. and it's not made by hands. Mm -hmm. And he he was bringing it in, and when he was crucified, that that didn't bring it in. That just finished the work that he had to do here, and there's still more to do. And and if you go back to the uh, beginning there, talking about man and uh, God, you know, he was predestinating them. Pre that that's a continuance. This predest a lot of that predestination is a continuance with us in this world. And then you get to Revelations, like I said, he was telling and warning all those churches of that day what was coming. And it, it was a, the destruction of Israel. The, the temple was going to be gone again. And that there was a new temple. And it was not made by hands. And we are that temple. Mm -hmm. And then you get in Revelations, in my mind, you look at it, he's speaking to us too in a spiritual sense. That was a literal, natural sense but now those things that they were talking to them about with that literal and natural, uh, it's spiritual to us because this day is the day of the Spirit of the Lord and that was what he was bringing in and he did. His Spirit, the Christ. That's, that's, what, the, that's what Christ is. It's the anointing Spirit of God. 
And people all, you know, they uh, there's a there's a wrong Jesus that people preach. And that's that Jesus they bring up at Easter and uh, uh, Christmas. This Jesus went back to his father and they became one as they were before the world ever was. And he's not a man anymore. We don't know, and we're not supposed to know no men after the flesh anymore. Because we're to know them after the Spirit. And each person has got the Spirit of God, and they got a gift of God in it. And it's, and it's up to them to follow that. And if you follow that, you'll live. If you don't, you'll die. And when you die, that don't mean you're going to stay dead forever. I've been dead so many times I couldn't count them. Uh, and that's what Paul's talking about. You know, he died daily. As long as we're in the carnality, we're, we're in death. For the carnal mind is dead. And we still have that, see? So he, he's talking to them. He's talking to us. It's for, it's for God's people. A book of instructions for us to move forward and to improve and get closer to him like Brother Jimmy did. And that's basically what Paul's really preaching. That's really his doctrine is trying to bring his people closer and more into this new covenant with God where we can be closer with God. Not that we can know God, but rather know him. And when that comes, you're no more in the flesh. You're in the spirit. You're a spiritual man, and that's that spiritual body that the world's looking to come for out there. And there is a one spiritual body, which that's his whole body, which is him. And you know, I might be a thumbnail in it. That part of that body, because it's the whole world. And there's, you know, <laughs> Paul gets in that. He says, uh, uh, you know, there's some body parts that's not too commonly, and we don't speak about it. Well, you know what he's talking about, don't you? And the, the Bible gets into some things like that, that the world thinks you're crude and vulgar and nasty, and you, you, you can't be like that. Just like he talks about with our uh, uh, righteousness, this filthy rags. It's talking about a menstrual uh, rag of a woman. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying, and that's what it means. But you say that to the world, they think you're some kind of pervert or something, or a devil. They don't know anything about it because they don't, like Brother Johnson. That stuff's so deep, think about that, that a God of infinite uh, wisdom put that in men's mind to show it just, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Think about it. And the closer we come, the more we can know about it. And that's my desire. It always has been. And from the uh, moment he, he gave me birth, I wanted to read. And I never read a book in my whole life. Now that's almost not true. Never took a book home and going to school. Uh, I thought you'd assist if you if you're smart. You know, oh, I want to do play ball. Well, I started reading because I watched that and saw that the men I was listening to uh, get up there and they didn't know nothing. And I'm not making fun of them, it's just a fact. A lot of them couldn't read and I ain't making fun of a man like that because. A man like that, God can use in preaching. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is if you don't take an effort in learning that stuff, it's, you know, I thought when I got saved, or what they call got saved, when God came and gave me that life, that I know it all. Well, I was still as dumb as a rock, man. That's the deal left. <laughs> uh, I was still re smacker too, after, after a few hours when that spirit left. Uh, I was still re I, I am still re -smack. And that's what the world tries to preach and tell and teach you that you're some kind of special person and all you got to do is sit back and wait and you're going to heaven. And you'll know everything about God and anything you need to know, you've got it right there in you when you don't know nothing. You might learn a few things on the road, but if God hadn't revealed them to you, it's the same as not really knowing it because this is what I, and it pushes me, I believe in a knowledge doctrine to know God and, and be known of Him and know the truth, not just believe it, but know it. Because when He reveals that to you, you how are you going to take it? This is like coming over here old growth. I wouldn't have never known about that 
500 mile, nine uh, a mile road out here until I came. Yeah. You, Brother Roy told me about it, and, and I believed him, but I didn't know it, but now I can come back over here and I don't need Brother Roy or somebody tell me. That's the same thing with God. When he shows you something, there ain't nothing ever gonna make you change from that. Nothing, because you know it. I know how to get to Akron, Ohio now, because I've been up there. But the first time I went, here it was. The same way with, you know, getting into this thing. God, uh, it's, it's just like smacking you in the face. You know, you'd be reading that and you know, oh, it just, because it's contrary to the world and flesh and even religion. There's the guy who made a little comment about uh, what was Jesus' religion on uh, Facebook yesterday. And I told him, I said, Jesus didn't have a religion. And he said, what was the difference between man's religion and Jesus' religion? I said, that's exactly, you answered it right there because it's man's religion. <laughs> this is not a religion. This is life. This is the truth. This is the way. And this is the resurrection. And that's why it takes that to be with our own group. It's been shown to us, and it's facts, and it's truth. And they don't want the truth. All they want is three or four little things. I'm going to heaven. I got saved. I got my name. I got baptized. I drank a little wine uh, and a little piece of bread. I'm going to just say that right out there, and then I'm going to quit. Uh, every one of those ordinances, baptism, drinking the wine, the bread, they're all over. They're not for this day. It was for that day. That day was coming to an end. And he call, uh, Paul calls them the weak and beggarly elements of, of them. But then there's another part of his hat right there. I wish I could have retained that, uh, telling us it's not. But you know, the very words of Jesus, you hear them. I went through that for four, uh, 25 years, and I never got a thing out of it. But I did, because, you know, it's a custom. And if somebody wanted to do it today, I'd do it with them. You know, that's the way, you, I, that's the way I think you're supposed to be. And I've baptized several people since that God showed me that. If you feel like you need to be baptized in that water, I'll take you down there. But by the truth, you know, and I'm going to show you right here, what, besides that, what Paul said. Dig out and walk, work on that when you go home about those things. Uh, just don't take my word for it. But you, you know, they get up there and Jesus said, uh, when they took that uh, bread and wine, they took the last uh, one there, he said, do this till I come again in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did he come or did he? He came back and after that coming back and it wasn't, you know, just uh, being uh, the grave. It was it, when they just, see, because the Jews, you know, they, they kept doing all that stuff even after Jesus was crucified, you know, killing animals and all that stuff, uh, doing them ordinances. They had so many ordinances back then, that's just like baptism and stuff. You know, that Paul, there wasn't just one baptism in the, under the law and under Jesus' day. I think it was five or six, wasn't it? But, you know, washing your hands was baptism back then under the law. And that's what Brother John said. You get in that stuff in that, uh, what they call the law, you know, I've been in uh, churches that said you should just throw that book away. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it's over, it's gone, it's dead, buried. They don't believe you should even have to read it. It's got nothing in there for you. Well, they're far from that. And I'm telling you, that's on Baptist belief. Wow. But Jesus said that when he come back again, but when the day that he come back was in the day of the destruction of the temple, and that was the coming of the Lord. And it was kind of just like what Brother uh, Jonathan was on there about, uh, uh, you know, uh, evil people coming to do the Lord's bidding. That, them eagles, that eagle that he's talking about there, them Roman soldiers come and destroyed that place. They didn't leave a rock, a stone that wasn't, 
And I can remember the first time I ever heard uh, Williams, the old man Williams, preach. When a man preaches a sermon, and that's been probably 30 years ago, and you can remember it, it was for you and it stuck. But the first part of it, he, he was talking about the old days, you know, like in the 20s, and uh, they had like 12 kids then, and his mother <laughs> ups and has twins. So he would, he said, you, he watched his mother chew that meat up and stuff and put it in a little baby's mouth. They didn't have Gerber baby food if you could run the store. So that's how she'd feed. And he said, that's how we're supposed to feed people that don't have the, this knowledge. He says, that's different if you've got a whole congregation of your people, but you know, you, you just don't go out and choke somebody to death with people on the stage. Talk about God. But then, you know, and he, he had to have some knowledge of it. So some of them old timers had the knowledge of you know, the destruction of the temple that brought in the new day. And if you read a lot of those scriptures, you know, that's what they call uh, the Gospels, you, you've got to see that it's talking about the uh, uh, dispensation that's coming to an end and it's over, you know, because it don't work. That Some of those hell things and stuff, it don't work bringing it, you know, like it was then. But he made a statement, and I can remember that too, he said, you know, whether this is right or wrong or just a fairy tale or just no, you know, wise tale. He said that they claimed that there was one stone upon another one when they finished the carnage of that temple and one of the Roman soldiers went over and kicked it, kicked it off. So they wasn't a stone left. But see, that's what you begin to see that this thing, even to, when you get to the New Testament, it's deeper than just reading because that was law. They were under law then. That wasn't grace. And even to till Jesus died and come back, his spirit come back at Pentecost with the spirit that was bringing in that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's where the, the body was born, or the, uh, what? How's that go? One day uh, the church was born, and one day the whole body it was born a man, and that's the man child. That's the Christ. He's, he's the man child. Now he, you know, they're looking for something out there different. But we are the man child because we are the party. He, he's the head and we're the body. And that's the man child that's in this world. And we're supposed to be doing a lot of different things. We're supposed to be doing like Christ. Like you said, Brother Jimmy. And Brother John said, we're supposed to be like in Christ. And even though we've got a lot of good things with us, most of us don't use that light in that manner today. Right. We've gotten too proud. We've gotten too big. And maybe that's what's coming in this world because there's something coming in this world. And it's God in charge. Uh, it may be Biden. It may be Obama. And then next year it may be Trump. But there's something coming and it's working. And it's working for a pretty bad end in my opinion. And that's what God, you know, that's usually how he brings his people up. You look at Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, all they can talk about is homosexuals. Sodom and Gomorrah. That wasn't their sin. It was pride and having too much. Yeah. And that, ain't that where we're at? Excess. Yeah. Excess. We don't look up. Our forefathers, they planted in the ground, and they looked up because if they didn't come, they didn't come up, they didn't eat. And I stand and marvel with that a lot, especially in, you know, in Kentucky area, and them mountains, and them rocks, and you know, very few little places that's flat. How them old people survived and lived? It's, it's amazing. If it, to me, to me, that even proves the word of God. Uh, look what we do today. We have to have a, a store right beside us just to survive. And two refrigerators, a freezer, and, you know, two or three stoves. But they made it, and they were happy. And just like everybody else is here, they'll spend every dime they got to stay here, unless there's something wrong in the mind. And when we ain't here, we don't know where we're at. That's what the hell's called about, you know. But as far as the body, uh, it goes back and the spirit of God. 
And that spirit of God, what it knows, and you know, we may be right part of God, know everything. I don't know. That's my hope. You know, I say we just be a part of it, God, and uh, be a, you know see everything like He does. But I know, and they'll kill you for that for not knowing. And I'd rather have somebody tell me they don't know something. It's a lie. It's going to make up a big story. And th that's what they've done. They sold them the oceanfront property in Arizona. And, and they sucked it up dry. That's what I guess what I said, right? Brother, just whatever y'all want to do, let's close this thing out. I was going to say, talking about gardens, my mom said when they lived at Camp in Cali, my grandpa would go up in the mountains there, oh, plant yeah. corn, and then they moved up here in Darnell Town down here, and they had to walk to Calvin, her and her sisters, to hold that corn. Yeah. You know, his papa went to work at Calvin. They walked to work in the morning with him, hold that corn that he planted, come back with him after work. One of the uh, first memories of my God as a kid coming to Kentucky, my great grandpa was on that up on that mountain. Up there. We, I had to go up there and see him because I loved him. And, uh, we come in, I ask where you're at. He's up there for an old mule, that mountain, and it just like this, plow that mountainside up. And back then, though, you know, there wasn't hardly a mountainside around here that wasn't cleared all that <laughs> corn or something growing on it. But they knew how to live, they was taught, and you go all the way back. You just think about that. I don't know. I can't even remember. You know, it, from then and all the way back, how do people learn? And some of the stuff that they know is they 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 don't know it today. These people are supposed to be the geniuses. They don't even know it, know how they did it or anything else. Uh, how did they get that knowledge? They said they let he said they let their hawks just run out mountains. Oh yeah. Them, whatever. I said, well, how come people people wouldn't come in and kill them, take them for sick? He said they knew better. They, knew. <laughs> yeah. they said they knew everybody who was all the zoos. <laughs> And Chestnuts was a, a gold falling off the trees. Uh, they lived off of that. That's where oh, yeah. the hogs, you know, ate. And they so they go to town, barter them, sell them, and they just knew how to live. That's it. They go, of course, pick up, chest, pick up chestnuts and then sit and play hug them. Yeah. <laughs> and they lose a bunch or <laughs> or win a bunch out of life. Of course, that's a hard life. <laughs> Yesterday was tough enough to. I said I wouldn't make it. <laughs> I got I me. Mean, you know, it's just. I'd I say it straight out. I couldn't make it. It's kind of like going to North Carolina <laughs> in the summer. If you go down there in the summer, you can't take it. But if you go down there before it gets and, and mellow into it, it you, you can't tell all this. You're just like a North Carolina. <laughs> I guess you you're raised to have to do it. I've done that one time. I went down there and turned around and come back home. And I love it down there and I love the heat, but I just couldn't take it. I'd been in the mines, you know, and finally got a vacation, went down there. <laughs> Man, that's hot. Like so, that son that lives down in Florida now, he hates it. <laughs> yeah. It may be my fault, I hope not, but uh, I forgot all about uh, texting Sister Diana and about me, and I don't know if she uh, knew about it, you know, or, or she had to stay with her mother. Well, uh, if we ever get the message out that we're going to meet the first Sunday, you know, and sit a stone, so to speak. Yeah, I, I told her that, but, you know, I don't know if she remembered it, you know, or yeah. what. I usually text her to remind her. I think she's having trouble too. Oh yeah, well, so she's staying with her mother full time. She is. She? Yeah, and then she can't get no help. Yeah, that's sad. She's staying with her all the time and she can't get help to come to me. Sad. Sad as he old, but you know, everybody's got to be blessed for it. Yeah. What y'all want to do? Walk out, pray, sing songs. Sing songs. Try to choose 47. Come here, get some water. I don't know why the old medicine's keeps my mouth so dry. I can't even.